Greetings, this is Artie from Artifact Electronics. In this episode we'll be having a look at a couple of these uh, MIDI effects boxes. They were built by Oberheim in the uh, late 80s and they are the uh, Perf slash X series. I'm not sure how this is supposed to be pronounced. Per FX, Perf X, Personal FX, I, I don't know. Uh, they obviously used engineers in their marketing department to come up with this name. Uh, the boxes were not overly successful. And it's not because they lacked functionality, but uh, I think one of the problems was uh, the only feedback you really get from the device itself is a two-digit seven-segment display. And uh, the whole thing is based on a matrix of parameters here where you select a row column and the user interface was really 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 bad didn't lend itself to live editing very well and uh, I think that's what kinda sunk them but uh, the original idea was pretty sound they came up with a cheap hardware platform a plastic case these devices and there were five different ones of them retailed I think at $299 street prices were closer to $200 on them but uh, again, I don't think they sold enough uh, to make this a success. Sad part about that is, is that the one you're looking at <clears throat> is called a Cyclone, which was a fully featured arpeggiator, which, uh, which really means uh, you uh, hook up a keyboard to the MIDI input. And uh, have a quick look at the back. And back we can see we have uh, MIDI in, MIDI out, power switch, and uh, four digital I.O. ports and these were usually used to hook up uh, momentary foot switches to them to change parameters during a performance uh, but on the Cyclone, the Cyclone will also record short sequences and uh, one of these was used as an output to generate a metronome click and uh, so it was pretty, it was universally built and the idea was we have a single piece of hardware and what we're going to do is write an app for it and uh, then we're going to go ahead and write yet another app for it and all we have to change is uh, put a new EEPROM in here which contains the app and uh, slap a new sticker on the front uh, a new control panel sticker and voila we got a new device <clears throat> they did that for five different devices the astute observer may immediately see that this looks kind of handmade with tape on it and stuff. And the reason for that is that uh, this particular unit didn't start out its life as a cyclone, but rather as a uh, systemizer. And the systemizer was uh, another device that uh, took a single MIDI channel input from your keyboard and you could basically reassign and remap everything that came from the keyboard to go to different channels and have different velocity curves and all that kind of stuff which at the time seemed kind of useful but uh, again because of the uh, user interface it was very hard to use and I don't think anybody ever fully utilized this thing to its fullest potential in its original form now remember I told you you could easily change these to uh, to become one of the other uh, units in this series. The Cyclone was one of the better ones. It was really fully featured. If you knew how to navigate the menu and do stuff with it, it could do some really wild and wonderful things. So basically what I did was I replaced the ROM in here the EEPROM with a Cyclone EEPROM and then I printed out a new control panel which I uh, taped to the front of it and uh, there's your Cyclone. So I pulled this guy out the other day because I wanted to play around with it. Let's give it some power. What really uh, I admire about this, it's based on an 8031 processor yeah, running at uh, 12 megahertz, which effectively gives an instruction cycle of uh, 1 uh, megahertz. 
but they really squeezed this processor because I've actually played with it. I put it on a debugger. I did some performance analysis on it. And uh, they are using the processor in here for everything it's worth. There are no uh, there are no empty cycles, no waits, no waiting periods, nothing. This thing just runs full time. So yeah, I spent, I know what the internals look like. Uh, you can see there's a piece of tape here where I've, I had actually converted this to something that had a big ROM in it and you could use these switches to select which ROM or EEPROM you wanted to do. So this one could actually be all five of the different units that Oberheim made. It was a cyclone, which is the arpeggiator here. There was a drummer, which was a performance-driven drum. Not a drum machine, but a drum controller. You still, they don't make any sound. Just send out the MIDI stuff. Then there was the strummer, which took keyboard chords and kind of tried to make them sound like guitars, but it just arpeggiated, again, it arpeggiated the chords you played and it didn't sound a whole lot like a guitar. That one wasn't a success. Of course, this one originally was the uh, systemizer which was a purely a control thing. It didn't even program or, or control any music generation through the MIDI. And the last one was called a Navigator, which also took the MIDI input and remapped it and did all sorts of wild and wonderful things with it. But uh, again, because of the uh, limited user interface, none of these are very successful at the time of their release. The Cyclone is kind of a... turned out to be kind of a sleeper, and people are paying now I think prices run around $150 and up on eBay when and if you can find these. I uh, bought this one years ago. It was, it was, I bought it as a systemizer. It had the systemizer uh, front panel sticker on it. And I figured, hey, I'll just convert it into whatever I want. And as I said, a new EEPROM and a new print out a new front panel and uh, there you go, you have a new device. So as I pulled these out, I turned it on, and uh, it comes on, identifies itself as version 1.2 originally, and then uh, shows you your user interface feedback right now. If you look closely, you can see the play button flash, the play uh, LED flashing, and that means it's in play mode right now. It's waiting for you to hook up a keyboard and play a chord on it, and then it'll just send out a bunch of notes, depending on how you've got the arpeggio set up, and uh, and play. So this one is functional. Uh, so the buttons work, the LEDs light up, and uh, so if you change the mode, and uh, let's say you want to go to I don't know, pick something. Uh, let's go to MIDI. That means you do a row and a column uh, selection. And here's the feedback. BC means it's set to a basic channel. Extend up. I don't even know what, see, I don't even know what this means. I don't remember anymore. I have to, you have to pull out the manual and look up what all of these abbreviations mean. And I think that in itself already uh, was a big problem here. That's all the feedback you get. Seven seg two times seven segments plus the uh, decimal point. So anyway, though, this one, I, I got it out. It seemed to, uh, seemed to power up. And I have a second one. So I figured, let's see if the other one powers up. And uh, the other one also has that same homemade look. It, this one is the uh, drummer. It started his life as a navigator, but same thing again, new EEPROM, new front panel, and uh, and there you go. So let's power this one up. And power is applied, I turn it on, and absolutely nothing happens. Now when I play with the power switch a few times, I can get one of the LEDs, this one, to come on. But of course it's not going to do it now. There you go. I can get this LED to light, but there's no button response, nothing lights up in here, nothing is working. 
So let's have a look at the inside and see if we can uh, bring this guy back to look uh, back to life. Now I'm going to tell you right off the bat that uh, this is not just going to be a simple repair, but uh, I ran into an interesting snag during the repair procedure, and uh, well, let's get started, and then I'll tell you about what I ran into. I removed a few screws, and that allowed me to lift off the uh, back panel. And then I removed a couple more screws, and that allowed me to lift out the PCB. So you can see everything is contained on the PCB. There is nothing, no connectors mounted to the case or anything like that. So assembly was probably pretty painless on these. Now, I might be jumping over a few points very quickly here. I apologize for that right off the bat, but... Uh, Years ago, I, I've seen quite a few of these, and uh, I've repaired quite a few of these. Uh, nobody ever asked me to do a conversion, but they just sent me dead ones. And a uh, quick walkthrough here is, of course, here are the uh, buttons, the display, and the LEDs. And interspersed in between them, of course, there's your EEPROM here. Uh, there's a RAM. Uh, the RAM part is kind of interesting. They were originally supplied with a grand total of 8K of 8 bits of uh, SRAM, but uh, they are wired so that you could put a 32K uh, SRAM in here and essentially, what was it, like quadruple uh, the uh, number of presets you could save in there and uh, that was, they, they actually mentioned in the manual, they gave you a part number and basically said open it up, buy a new RAM and put it in However, if you do that, you void your warranty, but uh, uh, I guess they didn't really care. They didn't want people sending it in for a RAM upgrade, so they were nice enough to tell you how to do it. Here's the 8031, and uh, this is kind of a weird layout. There even is a warning next to it. It says, no portion of pin 1 when installing microprocessor U5. Uh, all the chips have their pin ones, they're all oriented upward. The notches are here, but what they did here is uh, the CPU has the notch over here pointing downward, and they and even though this thing isn't even socketed, you can't socket this because of the way the case is made. Uh, I don't think that this would fit. I can't be 100% sure, but I, I thought it was kind of weird that they wouldn't socket the processor too. And uh, but uh, that's uh, uh, the battery. Uh, the battery was uh, the battery. The RAM was battery backed, so it saved all your presets and everything you did. And there was a bunch of nickel and dime glue logic uh, that interfaced, uh, that read the buttons, lit the LEDs, and the uh, seven segment display. And that's about that's about all I can say. It has the four quarter inch uh, jacks over here, MIDI in and out, and of course the power and uh, the power switch and the power connector. Now, uh, when I repaired these, usually the uh, most common part to fail was the regulator over here, which is a 7805, it takes in 9 volts and uh, regulates it to 5 volts. I think the reason why major failures were in that is, uh, let's have a quick look at the uh, power supply schematic here, and uh, I mean it's just the basic data book application and uh, they, uh, they threw in a few inductors here to regulate what's coming in, and that basically the input uh, it's a DC. It requires a DC supply, and that feeds the 7805 directly over here. Now, one interesting thing I noticed was this is actually labeled. The input is labeled as six volts, required six volts, and uh, most likely that was a typo or somebody didn't know what they were doing, because the 7805 needs about two and a half volts of headroom, i.e., the input has to be two and a half volts or more. Uh, 
in order to properly regulate the output at 5 volts. This is not an LDO, this is uh, a, it's not a, a low dropout uh, regulator. Low dropouts uh, can do, can regulate voltage with, with a few extra millivolts at the input. This one, I mean the 6 is, maybe the 6 got printed upside down, but uh, the case itself is labeled as uh, requiring 9 volts over here, so I'm glad somebody caught that error before they uh, sent this thing out. But the main reason that the regulator fails is, if you look at this, is uh, it does have the inductors in line, but it has no reverse voltage protection. And you know how it is, uh, devices get used, and then the uh, power supply gets lost, and then there's a mad dash for, okay, let's find a power supply that says 9 volts on it, and one that has a plug that fits in here, and let's plug it in. Well, if the polarity is wrong, these regulators really don't like to be reverse, uh, reverse polarity input, and they will blow up pretty quickly, and that's probably why the most common problem in these was that the regulator just blew up, and, uh, and just didn't work anymore. So let's check the regulator. Now, uh, I did misspeak in the last segment where I said that an LDO just needs a few millivolts above the regulated voltage. That is false. It needs a few hundred millivolts above the regulated voltage to work properly. So, correction made. Now let's have a look and see what the voltage regulator is outputting. Now remember, I got the LED to light, the LEDs on, so the regulator is doing something over here. But uh, let's see exactly what it is it is outputting. And instead of measuring the uh, regulator directly, I'm just going to measure it at uh, one of the TTL supply rails without covering up the readout. And uh, we're pretty dead on on 5 volts. It's not the regulator. So uh, we need to get out uh, a logic probe. Well, we really should get out a scope, but uh, in cases like this, it's, it is a lot easier to use the probe, so that's what I'm going to use. Okay, so voltage is there, and now we've got to do some logic checking. A uh, quick refresher for those of you who have forgotten about the 8031. The peculiarity about it is it's an embedded chip, it has a Harvard architecture. But uh, what they did was they multiplexed the uh, data lines in the lower, I mean the data bus and the lower address bus. And I think the reason they did that is uh, if they had a separate data bus and the lower address bus, they would have had to add 8 pins to the package, making it a 48 pin package. And that probably wasn't uh, something that they really considered. Uh, in the uh, early 70s, I think, is when this thing came out. So, uh, so they came up with a clever idea that uh, they just multiplex those two 8-bit, that 8-bit bus, and let the customer go out and buy an extra glue chip and uh, to enable the multiplexing. The glue chip required is a 74, a 373, an HC series in this case, and what that really does is the processor basically puts the uh, lower address on uh, on this bus. It then uh, brings the uh, G or the enable line high, which latches the lower address onto the uh, the lower address bus, the secondary lower address bus. Then it brings that line uh, brings that line back up again or back down again, and then depending on whether it's reading or writing, if it's writing it just pushes out the data on this bus and it goes to the rest of the chips, or if it's reading then uh, it's activating some other chip that's putting uh, the data on these lines and it turns this, uh, the port 0 into an input and reads the data. That's how it handles that. Even though these are generally described as these are described as general purpose uh, I/O pins, and actually the way it's described deep down is that there's port zero, port one, port two, and port three. But port three have basically have specific 
control uh, lines coming out of it, uh, namely the one that uh, fires up the multiplexer and some other things. You can't reassign those uh, like on, a, on one of the later ARM on one of the ARM processes you have right now. You can't reassign where the address bus is coming out and, and what the data does. So even though it seems that it has, uh, let's see, 4 times 8, 32 uh, I O pins on it, that isn't really true because they have fixed uh, special functions on all of those. And uh, that's how this thing works. Now, what that means, of course, is uh, every 8031 or 8051 or 8052 or whatever is going to require a 74373 logic chip over here to handle the uh, demultiplexing of uh, the data and the lower address. And uh, one thing I found is uh, when you measure this and I've made that mistake before, is you, you poke around and you see that there's not a whole lot of activity coming out of the processor. And uh, so if we look at that, if we look at the 373 over here, let's see if we twiddle this, uh, can we get it to power up? Yep, second, second time's a charm. But uh, just looking at it, it's a control line, that's an output. Input, input, output, output, input, input. And hmm, that's interesting. One of the inputs is high. But uh, what this really means is, uh, of course, you would suspect the processor immediately. Uh, the lines are floating on it. It's got dead I.O. ports on it. But uh, you got to keep one thing in mind is that uh, when this processor boots up, it basically, for safety's sake, configures all of the I.O. ports as inputs. So when it comes up in an unknown state, when the board comes up in an unknown state, you know, there's no fighting on the bus. Well, at least not as far as this guy's concerned, because it's all set to inputs. And uh, that's why we see floats on all of the inputs on this. Uh, when it's uh, configured as an input and there's no load on that input or nothing's driving it, that line will essentially float around two and a half volts. And that'll make the logic probe not show anything. And again, you'd go, okay, the processor's defective, but no, because uh, if this thing can't initialize itself, then uh, all the lines are going to sit at inputs and nothing's going to happen. I check the EEPROM, and uh, the EEPROM is the EEPROM's good. I compared it to what I uh, to the binary file I had. So what that boils down to it could be the RAM. But uh, I suspect this guy over here because he's preventing the uh, processor to gain access to the remaining resources on this board. So I'm initially going to assume that this is the bad guy and we're going to replace him. And well, if that doesn't work, then I guess we got to go back to the processor. But uh, Let's go ahead then and uh, remove this guy. So uh, here's the uh, underneath of it. When I got this, it actually wasn't working. And uh, I pretty much checked everything. The uh, voltage regulator was good. There was an ECO, an engineering change order, that said add another cap to the output of the 5 volt regulator to keep that a little bit more stable. and. Uh, I applied that, but it still didn't work. I, of course, noticed uh, that the battery, just the coin, the backup battery, was bad, and it was directly PCB mounted. So I took out the old battery, I put in a socket, and then installed a 2032. And that's about the only sign of work being done. You can see that I resoldered these, it didn't clean them up properly. Also here, you can see that these were resoldered, but maybe there's ju they just resoldered them at the factory because the uh, wave soldering uh, didn't put enough solder on the power pin, on the power plug, and uh, you could probably break the uh, connections here pretty easily by jiggling the plug in there. Other than that, it looked normal, and I spent quite some time on it, and finally what I found was... Uh, and we get a look on the other side, and let's see how easy that is to show. Probably not very easy. 
But over here where it says R29, yeah, it doesn't really show up, but it looked like the trace from this resistor that continued over here. I mean, to me, it looks like it was cut deliberately. Because what are the chances of dropping something on here and uh, interrupting the uh, trace right where it comes out of the resistor? There's no scratching on either side of it. It's just this white dot over here. So it's almost like somebody was trying to debug this. and I, I really don't know. But what I did was I just uh, reconnected it over here, put a jumper, that green jumper on it. And uh, after that, it came right up. No more problems with it. So it has kind of a weird past, I guess, of someone trying to fix it. But the only thing that was bad uh, was that somebody had cut that trace and never put it back again. It also looks like these, the uh, seven segments here, look like they were resoldered at one point in time. Don't know if that, yeah, you see, you can see the discolor and the unevenness of the solder there. So maybe at some point in time somebody replaced the display on it. But other than that, really, I couldn't really see anything else. So uh, let's go ahead and remove this. Remove what, you say? This is the underneath of the uh, 373 over here. And uh, when removing chips, I don't know if I've done anything specifically in previous episodes, but on the actual target board like this, you have to be very careful. If you use soldering braid or a desoldering gun, it doesn't, on a two-sided board, depending on the solder used and how much solder they used, just doing it from the underneath usually doesn't, it, it doesn't in all cases release the chip because there's a whole bunch of solder on the other end uh, on top of the board. And no matter how much you suck out the solder here, the chip still won't really want to come out. And then you got to go to the other side and, and start doing the same thing, sucking all the solder out of from the top of, of here. And while you're applying all of that heat, the uh, traces on here are not the thickest in the world. And you will lift traces and you will start damaging the board. So on a board, that is something that, of course, I'm going to keep. I'm going to try to repair. The removal process is more destructive in that I cut the pins on the uh, chip itself and then remove the pins one by one. Let's see how close I can get to that while well, this piece of shit still focuses. Come on. Hmm. Anyway, you can now see it clearly. And so what I do is basically I cut all of the pins close to the body of the IC. And uh, you need kind of skinny cutters to get in between the pins. And uh, you go all around cutting the pins close to the chip. And the reason I do this is because now, once the chip is removed and all the pins are disconnected, you can simply heat up each pin and pull it out with the minimum risk of damaging the board. Alright, I finally got all the pins cut off. So, bye-bye chip. And we now just have the pins sticking out. And as mentioned before, what we can do now is just touch the pin soldering iron. Ah, it's stuck to the tip over here. And the pins just come out pretty easily. Heat the pin, grab it, and pull it out. And so you go all the way around it, pulling out the pins. All of the pins have been removed, no traces lifted, no drama, they just all came out one by one, and uh, there's a mountain of pins. 
And now to the next step, and that is using some solder braid starting from the underneath to remove all of the solder from the uh, empty holes, hopefully. Our candidate is here. So, you could, you could use a solder sucker. You could use anything you want right now because you're basically working on a pin-to-pin uh, -pin basis and uh, you don't have to be too worried about applying too much heat to this. Just don't hold the braid on the holes for too long. And as you're going through the holes, just take all the solder out. Make a first pass, remove all of the all of the solder, then hold up the board against light and make sure that you can clearly look through all the, the uh, 20 uh, holes. And when that is done, you've got the hole cleaned up. So after one pass on the bottom of the board with the iron and the braid, and then another pass on top of the board, seem to have cleared it all up. Now at this point, I, when removing a part, I like to clean it with some IPA on both sides. And uh, that's why. This one wasn't nearly... Oh, what did I do? I didn't even put it in to view. But yeah, I did the same thing here. No, no, I did get a lot of dirt off it. But it's clean as the day the board was made. And of course next what we need, we'll wait a little bit for the IPA to dry. It's a nice thing about IPA, it evaporates very quickly. <clears throat> now what we need of course is to install a socket like this. It's a machined 20 pin socket. And uh, before doing that, I guess I need to make sure that the uh, case will still fit. It's a good thing I uh, did a test fit on it because uh, there are cavities in the upper case that allow for the uh, EEPROM and the RAM chip to be socketed, but there's no cavities for these. I mean, it kind of, when I put a chip in here, it kind of fits, but it's flush against the plastic case, so the chip gets no airflow and it gets no heat transfer from a plastic case either. So, uh, I'm going to have to replace the chip. Uh, now, I mean, I'm going to have to solder the uh, replacement chip right in rather than using a socket. I really don't like that too much. I love to socket everything that I'm replacing, but in this case, uh, I'm just going to have to solder it in like all the other TTLs were factory soldered in. Now this is the part where I ran into the snag that I mentioned to you earlier, and that is, I was looking for a replacement, and uh, I'm ashamed to admit I do not have a 74373 chip, replacement chip. I have a lot of 374s, but no 373s. So, uh, I'm going to have to find a parts board and remove it from there. Uh, it's the weekend, it's early or late at night, and uh, of course, like any other normal person, I could just wait till Monday, go to the local electronics store, or even order this thing online, and then sit down and wait. But I don't like to do that. I mean, I like to finish up projects, and second of all, you leave the device open, and then screws get lost, pieces get lost, and by the time you get back to it, it, it it's a mess. So what I'm going to attempt is go through my collection of old boards and see if I can find a board that actually has any flavor of a 74373 on it, pull that off the parts board in a non-destructive way, and then install it into this board. So I huffed and puffed and I opened a few boxes, or blew open a few boxes, and of course in the very last box I opened, I found this. 
In looking at the uh, chip complement, of course I was mostly interested in the beginning at what these guys were, and it turns out that this is a more modern 8031 replacement. It's an ST90R30Z6CR. has more pins than the original 40 pin, but they didn't change the multiplexing. I looked up this part, they didn't change the multiplexing, they just added an additional 8 I.O. ports to it. So uh, I checked the rest of it, RAM, ROM, two PALs, but nestled in between the two PALs, if I can get this right side up into focus, focus, god damn it, well, I won't focus on it, but believe it or not, that is a 74HC373. Now, it's an, it's an HC part, which is high-speed CMOS, but it should work. Of course, the unknowns at this point are uh, that this board, I, I don't know where this board came from. Was this board functional? Uh, I, I have no, I can't recall where it came from. So, uh, getting this chip out, I mean, we don't even know if it works or not. But I thought this was a good thing to try out a new experiment, and that is in removing this chip, we can't just cut the pins off, obviously. we got to use a desoldering gun or a desolder braid or something like that. But I wanted to try something new. What if I use the heat gun on this? Could I just blow hot air on the back of it and then kind of put a screwdriver in it from this side and simultaneously try to pry it off? Well, it's an interesting experiment, so let's try that. Another interesting thing on this board, by the way, is a Western Digital... Uh, actually, it's not Western Digital, sorry. This stands for Western Design Center. <clears throat> and what this is, is a floppy controller. If you look at the other end, you see it has a floppy connector and a floppy power connector over here. So, uh, this chip is probably non-Optanium at this point in time, so this is actually a valid chip I'm going to pull and put into safe storage. But uh, for now, let's get out the heat gun and see what kind of a mess we can create. So, uh, put some metal underneath it, and I mark the chip. Now, if I really cared about this board, I would probably cover it with aluminum foil with only a cutout for this, but I don't really care about the board, so uh, let's go ahead and preheat it. And usually what I do is I preheat the board until the airstream can actually melt solder. Not yet. This gun usually heats up pretty quickly. There you go. It is melting solder now, so let's see if we can get this chip to fall out. And if it doesn't, we'll have to use some help from the other end and try to pry it out. The solder is melting, but it's not falling out. Yeah, I don't... I don't think this is working really well, but it looks like the pins... It is coming out. But it's being very stubborn. So, before I blow up this chip, I mean, one side is entirely out, but the other's still there. I'm going to use some solder braid on it and see if I can remove the chip and straighten the pins on it. Alright, I finally got it. I had to go through every pin. I used the medium-sized braid, and then I used really small, thin braid like this, where I actually took the end and stuck it into the hole 
So this, this braid actually fit, fits inside the hole and then heated it and eventually it sucked out that extra row of solder and finally without any force I got the chip out and here it is. I straightened it in uh, using the uh, pin straightener here. Now I am uncomfortable with not socketing that chip. Remember how I said that there just isn't enough room. And if we look at the top of the case, here we can see the two cavities left for the RAM and the ROM, but then the chip would fits over here and there's it is flush against it. The board does sit properly in place, but the chip is basically flush against this and my initial concern was that uh, there's no airflow here and there's no uh, heat uh, exchange supported by the plastic case. But uh, on the other hand, this is an HC, I think. It's an HC, so it's a high-speed CMOS. And CMOS usually, CMOS itself doesn't use a lot of power. The high speed's going to make it use more power, but these things generally don't heat up. So what I'm going to do is uh, put the socket in here, and that way, if it doesn't work, that means I destroyed this chip or it was defective to start with. But if it really does butt up against this, I can grind this part of the case down a little bit to give a little bit of airflow to the chip. So uh, the decision is put in the socket. Okay, the socket's in. I did a relatively good job, I think. Uh, I guess I, I cleaned it up with uh, alcohol, but there's, it looks like there's some residue left there. But anyway, it's in place. I uh, plug the chip in. Now, before going any further on testing this, let me point out that uh, there's still a lot of variables remaining here that may dictate whether this thing comes on or not. I made the assumption that this chip was bad. So I pulled out the old one and I put a new one in, but I didn't really put a new one in because that one got stressed when I removed it from the parts board. So this could have been bad. This this may not even work properly, and I may have been totally wrong. Maybe the processor is bad, or maybe something else is bad in here. So, I'm not expecting too much. But, let's plug in power, and uh, say hail to the electron gods, and flip the power switch. S son of a bitch. Looks like it came up. So I'm going to have to use the front panel as reference for what the buttons do. But this is the start-stop button. And it's blinking this thing. That means it's actually outputting drum information right now. And if we go back to the uh, power-up, first it shows 3.8, and that is the firmware revision. Then it shows a 32, which indicates that it has 32K of memory. And uh, finally, it just goes into startup idle mode. And it's uh, ready to run, I guess. Oh, you can change this number. With these two LEDs on, if we look at the front panel, uh, we can see that these two LEDs intersect on preset. So basically, I can select select some presets on it. So, uh, it seems to be working. The chip isn't really getting hot. I'm going to investigate a little more and see and see if it 
if it really hits the uh, top of this case and uh, if I have to go ahead and grind it but uh, let me do that off off camera because that's going to be really difficult to show but I still can't believe this came up but <laughs> let's unplug power turn on power to uh, discharge the caps and put power back in again Yes, sir. It's still working, and it remembered that we had gone to uh, preset four. The only other thing that needs to be done, even though it works, is there's a hard reset you can perform, and that's you push the first three buttons, and then you turn it on, and it resets itself. It basically initializes the memory, so if there's anything odd in the patch memory, it just clears out everything and puts it back into factory state, so looks like it's working. This obviously uh, took a little longer than I anticipated, but I cannot stop right here because uh, I've proven that it can blink lights, and uh, but I haven't proven that it can do something. So I quickly hooked it up to a drum machine of equal vintage, or similar vintage, it's a rhythm composer TR505 by Roland. It's hooked up with a MIDI cable and I also hooked up a foot pedal over here and uh, the foot pedal is plugged into one of the inputs and what this causes is it causes the uh, drum sequencer to play a fill. So instead of just going to the regular ones let's start uh, with uh, preset number 94 which the manual tells me is called a snare beat and that's what it sounds like but when I use the fill and depending on when in the bar I hit the fill the longer the fill is and you can see that it's varying the fills so all of that seems to be working so that was called a snare beat uh, we can go to preset 90, which is called the Noompapa Waltz. Play some very appropriate fills here, but uh, that just kind of shows off what this thing can do. We go to number 87, which is a rock reggae with variation and fills which means it automatically will play fills without you even using this. But it's not playing any fills at all. I think I just collided with an internal fill and the manual fill here, but... Now this is all fully programmable and just gives you a brief idea of what this drum machine is capable of in terms of 19, uh, mid to late 1980s state-of-the-art drum sequencing, automatic drum sequencing. But uh, the last one I'm going to show you here is called Jazzy Rock with Variation and Fills. Well, it seems to vary the fills, and uh, generally it seems to work. So, uh, yes, we finally reached the end. I hope you enjoyed this, especially with the uh, twist, which was my own fault because I kept insufficient inventory of parts. Uh, come next week, I will, uh, well, not come next week, come uh, finishing this video, I'm going to get online and order like a dozen. 74HC 373s, so those become a permanent part of my part storage. But again, we're at the end. I uh, hope you liked it. Click the like button, and of course, if you haven't subscribed, then you know which other button to click. See you next time.